and what is the purpose of the crusade? Why is it necessary? Why do tell not have this? Is simple. Why do you are made of why? Sketch a two-stroke liner and table of the parties or the pursuit of what I think section E's questions were the easiest. There's hardly anything that we need to deal about. Mm. The simplest question, but nobody attempted, was name the principal components of a trunk type of engine. That trunk type of engine was one of the simplest engines to actually identify and write down. You have seen the diagram and you could have put it there. Excuse me, sir. Ah, uh, yes, go ahead. Sir, I had attended. Sir, I had attended this question, sir. Which question? Sir, trunk type. Ah, uh, name all the trunk type. Sir. That means in the trunk type, you yes. have a cylinder head. On the cylinder head, you have the mountings. You could have mentioned the mountings. Then, other than that, you describe the piston assembly, which is completely different from a two-stroke engine. Then, you describe how the connecting rod is fitted to the piston and there is no crosshead. And apart from that, you state what the bed plate is like. The bed plate may be a single bed plate or it might be an underslung crankshaft. Then there is a camshaft on the sides. There is a sketch in one of the PowerPoint programs which gives minute details of a four-stroke trunk type engine. So if you had studied that sketch, you could have written that answer very well. So this PowerPoint program, it has got a lot of information which you need to pick up. And apart from that, I have also given information which are not in the PowerPoint program. So that information is also relevant. So always keep a pen and paper beside you when you're hearing this lecture, because it is not only the PowerPoint information that you need to digest. You need to also absorb the information which I give you verbally because there's a lot of information which are missed out in the PowerPoint program and I can only put it across on a verbal mode. Satyanarayan Sen Gupta. Okay, that makes it 35. Okay. Now let's say um, 36. The number is not increasing. Yeah? How come? 35 to 35 and people are coming in. Or I don't understand this computer. Oh, 37. There you are. Two. It takes a little time. There's an ignition lag for, for that figure to be ignited to the real figure. And what is ignition lag? Ignition lag is same as ignition delay. It means, and oh yes, and now I point out, they were not in your section. In the other section where compression ratio question was asked, and there, a lot of boys have made a mistake of saying the compression ratio and the compression pressure is responsible for the diesel knock or knocking of the engine. That knocking of the engine has got nothing to do with compression ratio or compression pressure. The knocking of the engine is on account of a delay in the fuel igniting. The delay in the fuel igniting. Why does it happen? Now, pay full attention. What causes knocking in a diesel engine? I'm about to explain to you. You see, <clears throat> when a fuel is injected into the combustion chamber, it does not instantaneously burn. It does not. Now, I am speaking in terms of microseconds. And combustion is, is can be expressed only in microseconds. Because the engine running at 200 RPM, a slow speed engine, Meaning in which everything is in microseconds. So when the fuel is injected into the combustion chamber, it does not ignite instantaneously. There is a time delay. And this time delay is on account of two reasons. One is the fuel takes time to reach or rise in temperature up to the ignition point. Unless it rises to the ignition point, it will not ignite. Okay. So this time delay is dependent on how fast the time will help. So if it is a hot engine and the fuel is also heated, then the time delay is reduced. But if the engine is cold and the temperature of the compression compressed air is not high enough or just marginal near the ignition temperature, then it will take more time. So this time 
factor required to raise the temperature from the for, of the oil up to the ignition temperature take some microseconds okay this is one the second factor is the quality of the fuel now fuel is in different varieties paraffins old fins aromatics asphaltins so there are different grades of hydrocarbons you might have done organic chemistry in school so there are different categories and of the lot paraffins is the one that burns the best and asphaltins is one of the ones that burns very poorly or it doesn't want to burn very sluggish it takes a lot of heat a lot of time to start burning paraffin oils they burn instantaneously now with the quality of oil getting poorer and poorer we are buying cheaper and cheaper fuels so a good part of the oil that is put on board the ship consists of aromatics old fins and little bit of alpha asphaltins the these tend to burn a little slower so the time required to start it to burn also takes a little more time than paraffins so the two factors which causes a delay in starting to burn the fuel are one the time required to raise the temperature and two is the quality of the fuel all right now on account of the delay that means after it is injected it does not burn instantaneously and during this period more and more fuel comes in if you see the timing diagram it is say 10 degrees before tdc and 12 to 14 degrees after tdc It is the inject fuel injection period so 10 degrees before tdc when the fuel is injected till it reaches 5 and 6 degrees before tdc there is no combustion no ignition but the fuel keeps coming in and the fuel as the fuel keeps coming in there is more and more accumulation of fuel and when the fuel does start burning and the flame arises the entire fuel catches fire so then there is a very rapid rise in pressure this very rapid rise in pressure is called a rate rapid rate of rise in pressure not just rise in pressure rapid rate in rise of pressure where the gradient of the curve becomes very steep this very steep gradient is ultimately a very sudden pressure rise and this pressure rise is almost like a hammer blow on top of the piston so this hammer blow on the piston is regarded as a diesel knock so the main cause for diesel knocking is ignition delay because there is a delay there is more and fuel fuel coming into the combustion chamber and without burning but when it does catch fire when it just start burning the entire fuel burns instantaneously because the flame is already there previously there is no flame it is still coming in till the temperature is reached and the quality of the fuel decides the burning but when the flame occurs then the entire fuel takes fire and then there is a very rapid rise in pressure so the rapid rate in rise in pressure is shown by the gradient in the curve and that indicates a knocking effect on top of the piston this knocking is called a diesel knock somo mukherjee is come to early for the next class 9 minutes late okay up to 40 i will allow so this knocking of the diesel engine is not just bad for the piston it is also bad for the crosshead bearing it is also bad for the bottom end bearing it is also bad for the main bearing so on entirely the entire line of items which take the shock load are uh, have the tendency to get damaged and the crosshead bearing that is why is one of the most common places for mishap or damage you see the crosshead bearing is very difficult to lubricate one thing the next thing the force on the piston on the crosshead bearing is enormous in fact in academic interest you calculate how many tons of force comes suppose you have a diameter of 90 cm bore all right and 90 bar is the peak pressure so you calculate what is the total force 90 bar multiplied by the cross sectional area will be 15 to 16 tons that is the gas pressure 
apart from the gas pressure you have the weight of the piston you weight of the connecting rod uh, sorry you weight of the piston rod so those weights are also there on the crosshead bearing so design of the crosshead bearing is a very crucial factor because there is no hydrodynamic lubrication possible and because more hydrodynamic lubrication is possible you need to have a boost pressure that means the uh, almost the hydraulic pressure to force the oil under the bearing so let us have a look at the crosshead bearing and the details of the crosshead bearing okay now here the crosshead bearing if you have any questions and not able to understand do write it down on the chat column so i will be able to pay attention in the meantime pay full attention to the difficulties involved with the crosshead bearing the crosshead bearing is a forged steel block secured to the foot of the piston rod okay it includes the journal that means as the bearing or for the top end bearing which acts as a hinge by which the piston thrust is deflected via the connecting rod to rotate the crank all right so that is what the purpose is and the constructional detail the transverse force component is transmitted to the guide shoe and guide which also form part of the assembly so when you say crosshead assembly it means the crosshead the shoe and the guide these three components constitute the crosshead assembly okay the crosshead bearings are most difficult to lubricate of all the bearings on the engine the crosshead bearing is most difficult why is it so if you see in the next power plant program i will include a shot to one or two plates on hydrodynamic lubrication and that hydrodynamic lubrication if you understand as a mary as an engineer your concept on bearings will be completely changed and i intend to do that in the next class when i put the hydrodynamic lubrication now hydrodynamic lubrication is possible only in rotating shafts in the case of the crosshead bearing the bearings are not rotating they are swiveling you understand the meaning of swiveling it is going to and fro that means the connecting rod is only going from side to side while it is reciprocating so getting the oil under the bearing is a very difficult proposition more so because it is a two stroke engine all right in a two stroke engine you have the compression stroke and the expansion and the power stroke in both the cases the journal pins are always resting on the bearing there is never a time when it gets a relief that means doesn't come up by itself in the case of a four stroke trunk type of engine this problem does not exist though in that case also the connecting rod is only swiveling it does not have hydrodynamic lubrication because there is no rotation of the gudgeon pin no rotation of the connecting rod it is also swiveling much like your two stroke engine but there it is not difficult to lubricate why is it so because out of the four strokes one stroke allows the oil to come in from underneath that means through the connecting rod into the bush bearing and this oil coming in during the induction stroke is adequate for the remaining three strokes what are the remaining three strokes let us say first one is the compression stroke that means when it is being compressed there is pressure on top of the piston so the piston forces the gudgeon pin down onto the bush bearing so there is no clearance between the bush bearing and the connecting and the gudgeon pin so no oil can flow in between all right that is in the compression stroke next is the expansion or power stroke then the pressure on top of the piston is there and it pushes on the gudgeon pin gudgeon pin pushes on the bush and the bush cannot be lubricated because the oil passage is blocked okay that is the expansion stroke next is the exhaust stroke exhaust stroke also the as a connecting rod is pushing up the piston the moment it pushes up the piston it means the gudgeon pin is still resting on the bush so no lubrication can take place the next stroke which is called the induction stroke the connecting rod is pulling down the piston moment it pulls down the piston there is a clearance between the gudgeon pin and the bush now let's have a look at this diagram here 
to show you how it happens. Yeah, this one. Now, this is a four-stroke piston, all right? And this is the oil passage which comes to bring the oil into the gajin pin bearing. Okay. Now, as the oil comes here, you see the gajin pin is resting in this bush. And that bush passage for the oil is closed. So long as there is a, a force on top of the piston, the piston will be forcing down on the gajin pin. And the gajin pin will be forcing down on the connecting rod through the bush. What you see is the bush. So the oil passage will remain closed. This happens for the expansion stroke, the compression stroke, and the exhaust stroke. The only the induction stroke where the flywheel energy is used in pulling down the piston by the help of the connecting rod allows this connecting rod to pull upon the gajin pin and thereby create a clearance on the underside here. Moment there is a clearance here, the oil can flow into the space between the gajin pin and the bush. So then that oil is adequate to provide for lubrication for the remaining three strokes. Get the picture. So that is why the crosshead bearings are the most difficult to lubricate, but the gajin pin bearings are not difficult to lubricate because this is a two-stroke engine and because that is a four-stroke engine. Okay. So have you understood what I've said? Hey, what is that? Shashank Shekhar, you're providing us Excuse some music. Yes, Yes, what is it? Go ahead, say. Uh, can you explain, uh, please explain again the, why it is uh, in expansion stroke, uh, power stroke. Why it is uh, difficult to lubricate the gazing pin in expansion stroke? Okay, now again, in the four stroke trunk type of engine, you have a connecting rod which is attached to the gazing pin. All right, that you have understood. Have you understood this drawing, Shashank Shekhar? Yes. Your sound is coming a little distorted. But what I understand is that you need to be explained again how lubrication of this is possible and how lubrication of the two stroke is not very easy. Okay, I'm explaining that once again. In the four stroke engine, Okay, keep your microphone off. There's a lot of disturbance coming in. Okay, so the oil which is coming in for lubricating of the gajin pin comes in through the connecting rod. All right, so the oil actually comes through this passage here. And then it is blocked because the gajin pin is resting on the bush. Okay, so in the four-stroke engine, you have four strokes. One is the compression stroke. One is the power stroke or expansion stroke. One is the exhaust stroke, and last one is the induction stroke. Actually, you can start with any stroke to explain, but I have started purposely with the compression stroke. After compression stroke, you have the power stroke, which is forcing the piston down. And then after the power stroke, the exhaust gases have to be discharged, so the exhaust stroke. After the exhaust stroke has taken place, the next stroke is the induction stroke. And how does the induction stroke take place? The energy is taken from the flywheel to pull down onto the connecting rod. Moment the connecting rod is pulled down, then only air can come into the system or into the combustion chamber. So when the connecting rod is pulled down, you will see the contact made by the connecting rod is on top at the bush over there. And there will be a clearance, 0.1 millimeter clearance or 0.12 or 0.15 maximum will be the clearance over here. It is a fraction of a millimeter. But then there will be a clearance. Have you understood that? When the connecting rod is pulled down, then the bush will make contact on the gajin pin on top. And there will be a clearance at the bottom. When the connecting rod is pushing it up or the piston is pushing down on the connecting rod, then the entire contact surface will be at the bottom of that gajin pin. So the whole oil passage will remain closed. It is during the induction stroke that there is a clearance formed over here. And when that clearance is formed here, the oil manages to get into that clearance. And that oil coming into the space is adequate 
for the remaining three strokes when the pressure is on top of the piston and this passage is blocked. Have you understood now? Excuse that me, sir. I have a doubt, sir. Yes. Okay. Sir, how is it not possible uh, when in two stroke there is a uh, expansion stroke? Sir, why is it not possible then? Uh, the flywheel is also rotating at that moment. So, why don't we have a clearance at that moment? Flywheel is rotating to cause the compression. If the compression is there, what is going to rest on the bearing? Just as in this case, in doing the compression stroke, the, the oil passage is still closed. There is no induction yes, stroke in the case of a two-stroke engine, is there? No, sir. Then there is no clearance between the bearing and the uh, crosshead pin. So that is why at no time is the crosshead pin lifted off the bearing. So that is why getting the lube oil between the two surfaces is impossible. It cannot happen because all the time the pressure is there on the crosshead bearing. But in the case of a post-stroke engine, during the induction stroke, when the connecting rod is pulling down the piston, there will be a clearance on the underside. But it is not the same in the two-stroke engine. Okay. And when in uh, uh, power stroke in two-stroke, the, pist uh, the piston is coming down. Okay. So the force is on the bearing. The force is on the bearing. Isn't it? Shub? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And when it is again compression stroke, again the pressure is on the bearing. There is no time when the bearing is off from the crosshead. So that is why it is very difficult to get the oil. More so because it is only swiveling. It is not taking a full rotation. The bearing is not taking a full rotation. Okay. So that is why it is very difficult to lubricate the crosshead bearing and you need external boost pressure of oil to force it in the crosshead bearing for lubrication. A crosshead becomes necessary when the stroke is long and the angularity of the con rod fouls with the liner at the lower end. This occurs at mid-stroke of the piston. Why at mid-stroke? Because at mid-stroke, the bottom end bearing is at the maximum diametrically horizontal position. If you see the crank throw rotation, it is a circular rotation. What is diameter vertically is also the diameter horizontally. So when the piston is at mid-stroke, that angularity is at the maximum because the bottom end bearing is out from the center line to its maximum on the circular path of the crank throw. All right. So that is why that is the time when the angularity of the connecting rod will foul with the cylinder liner if there is no crosshead. That is why you have a crosshead. Now let's have a look at the design of a crosshead. This is one simple, flexible designed uh, crosshead. This is the crosshead pin. It is actually only a pin. There is, it is only a cylindrical barrel with a hole in the center. If you see, look at this construction. Don't read this as yet. I will explain that reading matter later. First, look at the sketch and it speaks a thousand words. You see, this pin over here, it is round over here, round over here, and a little extension is also there to accommodate the shoe. Okay. Now, at the center of the crosshead pin, you have a hole which allows the piston rod to pass through. The piston rod is machined to a reduced diameter at this section. And much lower down, it is a threaded section. This threaded section allows for a nut to be fitted in and tightened. So once this nut is tightened, this piston rod is hard fixed on the uh, crosshead pin. All right. So now the crosshead pin is a rigid body along with the piston. It can only reciprocate. It cannot turn. It cannot twist. It cannot go sideways. It is a rigid body. And it is even more fixed in position once the shoes are fitted. The shoe is fitted here and the shoe slides inside a guide. And the guide is fitted onto the A-frame. So that helps in keeping the alignment of the piston rod in line with the cylinder liner 
and the crankshaft center line. Okay, now let's look at the two bearings. Now here there are two bearings on either side of the crosshead pin. This is one bearing and the bearing support is at the bottom. This is a cast iron or maybe, yeah, it is cast iron generally or maybe cast steel. So it is ultimately bolted to the tabletop of the connecting rod. So why is it called flexible? You see this section over here. It is not a rigid block. It is something like a C section. So C section gives some, some amount of flexibility. Now this flexibility is in microns, maybe one hundredth of a millimeter, but it does provide some flexibility. The piston, let's read now what he says. Crosshead design with flexible support. The piston rod is rigidly fixed to the crosshead pin by the nut. That you have understood. The two bearings support the two pins on either side. Okay, so the two pins support the two bearings on either side. Okay, the bearing supports are bolted to the connecting rod. The bearing supports are bolted to the connecting rod. These are the supports. That means the lower part of the bearing. It has to be based on something. So it is based on the tabletop of the connecting rod and it is bolted. These center lines that you see are actually space for the bolts to be fitted. So ultimately, the extended portion of the pins are intended, these portions are intended for the guide shoes. So this is one design of a crosshead assembly. And you can understand this connecting rod that you see at the bottom can be drawn towards you and away from you. So it can swivel in this direction. All right. So this is one format of a crosshead bearing. Now, there is a problem here. The problem is, and I told you, if you have a very large load on this, at all times the load is acting, that means at all times the load is on these bearings. And the load is something like 15 tons. So, to accommodate that 15 ton, you need very strong white metal bearings. And white metal is the metal that is used for the bearing. And that white metal is made up of Copper, tin, lead, and antimony. These are the four principal components. Apart from these four principal components, you may have uh, some little bit of other elements too. Zinc, and there are cadmium, coronium, and a whole lot of other metals in microscopic parts. And the permutation combination of these four elements in various strengths will give different categories of white metal. So the designer, when he designs the bearing, he will also have to check into how much load it has to take, what is the speed it has to move, what is the area it is permitting. And based on that, he will choose a particular grade of white metal to be used for that bearing. White metal has a property called conformability. This conformability allows the bearing pin to sit in the white metal and the shape of that pin is accommodated by that white metal because it is a lot softer than the uh, forged steel pin. So it ensures that a large area is in contact with the pin, thereby reducing pressure per unit area. So one of the key design necessities is maximizing the surface area on which the load acts. And that helps in reducing the pressure per unit area. So once you have reduced pressure per unit area, then the stress on that bearing is much less, much reduced. And at the same time, the possibility of getting the oil underneath that surface is a lot easier. So these two factors call for a larger surface area on which the bearing is supported. All right. The top part of the bearing need not be of a large area because the load does not come there. It only helps to keep the crosshead in position. But the underside of the bearing needs to be as large as possible. So this helps to reduce the pressure per unit area. And that helps in not damaging the bearing easily. Number two, it helps in providing lubricating oil between the two surfaces much more conveniently. So how do we increase the surface area at the bottom? 
Let's have a look at the next diagram. Now here you see a crosshead with a little different in design. Uh, this is called a one-piece lower bearing. If you see under the bearing, the bearing shell is a complete surface on top of the uh, tabletop. You get it? Now, <clears throat> you see, this is the shell and this is the key. The whole thing is supported underneath so that the crosshead pin, the entire surface allows for contact. So there's a larger surface area. So the per pressure per unit area is much reduced. On top of the pin, a portion is machined, flattened. A flat per portion is machined out so that the piston rod palm can be bolted onto the crosshead pin. So now you have a crosshead pin which has a large surface area on the underside. And of course, on top, it just has to hold the crosshead in position, the, in position with the bearing. So this bearing is much less stressed out. So the chances of this bearing metal at the bottom breaking or getting damaged is very, very reduced as compared to the previous diagram. Let's read what he says. The crosshead with improved bearing support. As the load on the crosshead bearing is continuous. Now, should you understand what it means? That at all times, the load is there on the bearing. There's never a time where there is any relief. That is what it means by crosshead bearing is continuous load. And significantly large. Significantly large is for you to calculate. 90 bar pressure on a cross-sectional area of 90 centimeter dia. You calculate and see on your calculator how much how much is the load on top. 90 bar is almost 90 kg per centimeter squared and you calculate 90 centimeter diameter of the bore and find out the total area. Okay, so that will give you an idea how many tons of force is there. So we need to maximize the bearing area to reduce the pressure per unit area. It is necessary to reduce the pressure per unit area. This is done with a continuous bottom support while the top of the pin accommodates the piston rod palm. You see, top of the pin does not have so much of load. So it is machined out and a flat surface is achieved on which the piston rod is directly bolted onto the crosshead pin. Okay, Lubrication is done under boost pressure. When we do lubricate, lubrication of engines, we will do this. Lubrication of, is done under boost pressure, by increased pressure. And the crosshead pin is also made of forged steel. What is forged steel? Forged steel is actually machined out from wrought iron. Wrought iron, after it comes out from the furnace, is beaten from all sides. And all the flux and the ash, all the impurities are squeezed out because in semi-molten state, that iron can be pure iron. And most of it is pure iron. So this hammering of that iron from all sides removed all the flux and the, as, uh, what do you call that? Uh, anyway, that's the unwanted stuff in the irons, impurities. And then it is machined out. So it gives a very good quality forging. Okay. Next diagram is what I have drawn. And this is even more explanatory to most of you. And this is the diagram for an old engine. And it is, uh, I think, the best diagram you can give to an examiner. So let's have a look at it. This is an MAN engine of an old variety. But it will also explain to you how the lateral forces of the crosshead are accommodated and taken care of. Okay. Let us start that the crosshead assembly consists of three components. One is the crosshead by itself. One is the shoe, which is attached to the crosshead. And then that shoe has an arrangement where it can slide inside a guide. Okay, And the guide itself is fitted to the A-frames by means of scantlings. Scantlings are attachments on the A-frame to help accommodate the guide in complete alignment of its movement, of the shoe movement. Okay, now let me explain that once again. You have seen the A-frames. They are all at a slope. The sides are at a slope. Okay. 
but the crosshead which has to be supported on the a frame has to move perfectly vertical all right okay so now that guide which has to guide the crosshead to move absolutely vertical has to be fitted to the a frame but the a frame is at a slant so how is it going to be fitted so there are arrangements within which are called scantlings these are welded structures on the a frame which allows for the guide to be fitted in a vertical mode the a frame may be at a slope but the scantlings of different sizes will arrange to accommodate the guide and fix it to the a frame while maintaining its vertical position absolutely vertical position because the crosshead has to travel only in the vertical position and the guide has to be held in the vertical position but the a frame is at a slope so between the a frame and the guide you have what are called scantlings these are frame structures which are welded onto the a frame to help achieve perfect alignment of the guide have you understood what i said yes sir yes sayantun sangupta you have said the shoe moves with the guide guide does not move guide is fixed guide is fixed to the a frame guide only provides the path for the shoe to move okay uh, that should be easy to understand now let's look at this crosshead over here the crosshead is a square block actually and this square block has got four studs which will accommodate the piston palm just now i will show you pictures of the piston rod and the palm and you will see how the palm of the piston is square in section in its uh, construction and that little uh, hole over there you see is part of the palm in some cases where it is protrudes so once it goes into that hole that helps in aligning the piston rod with the crosshead and the four studs that you see here they help to lock the palm in place with the help of nuts on the side of the crosshead you will see two machined pins these are called pins and these pins are what provide the entire force on top of the bearing in the connecting rod the connecting rod is fitted to these two pins by means of bearings and then the connecting rod goes down to the crank pin so these two pins are ultimately getting the load the load comes on top of the crosshead the crosshead transfers the load to the pins and the pins transfer the load on the bearings of the connecting rod and the connecting rod gets loaded that's how the force vertical is transmitted ultimately to the crank pin all right now because there is some angularity of the connecting rod there will be a transverse force on the crosshead this crosshead force is ultimately in one direction when the piston is coming down and it is in the opposite direction when the piston is going up because the angularity of the connecting rod once changes from one side to the other side so that is why the force on the crosshead for every revolution or half a revolution is on one side and the other half of the revolution it is on the other side okay now let's look ahead now this what you see here is called the shoe the shoe has got two flanges one is a small flange on that side and one is a larger flange on this side and in between there are uh, medium to connect the two flanges they are actually made of again i think cast iron or cast i think cast iron only so this is ultimately bolted to the surface of this shoe over here there is one thing what more you need to know you see there's a hole on the pin and a hole on the pin on the other side too apart from that there is a hole on this side which goes and makes the connection to the other hole or it goes right through and through now when the oil is provided for lubrication of the crosshead bearing it is provided at this hole so this is vertical or at right angles to the hole that you see inside the crosshead pin because you can never drill a hole at right angles you can only drill a straight hole no matter how good your drill machine is it can drill only a one path hole but you need the oil to go sideways so you need to drill a hole from this end right through 
and then plug up or block this hole over here and block the hole at that end. Then you need to drill a hole on the side to meet that hole that has already been driven. So the oil can go in from here, turn around and go to the other bearing. On its way through, in the center of the crosshead, there is another hole drilled right inside to the center. And then another hole drilled from here to meet that hole at right angles. All right. So the oil which is provided here ultimately travels through this oil passage, lubricates the other bearing also. Then it travels through this passage and comes out from the crosshead from there. And what does it mean by coming out from there? You see, when the shoe is attached to the crosshead, there is a hole through the shoe right through. So the oil travels through the shoe and provides the lubricating oil for the shoe and the guide because they are also rubbing against each other. So they need a lubrication. So that oil actually comes from the crosshead and it comes through the shoe and this is the hole from which the oil comes out. And as it emerges from here, it is allowed to spread on the entire surface by means of grooves. These are shallow grooves which allow for the oil to transport itself right to the complete surface. And these grooves have a curved surface at the edges where the grooves are made. So when it slides, the oil is allowed to spread. And as it spreads, the entire surface gets lubricated. So when it is moving in the power stroke, the maximum thrust exerted by the crosshead is through the shoe onto the guide. And the guide is ultimately bolted to the A-frame by means of scantlings. So that is why the A-frames have to be very strong to ultimately take that lateral force from the crosshead. Okay, so that is the power stroke force that is transmitted to this surface. But what happens when the uh, uh, crosshead, uh, when the bottom end bearing goes beyond the BDC and the piston starts its compression stroke? And the force then is in the opposite direction. So now the guide shoe, or rather the shoe, will be pulled in the opposite direction. So to get a support on the opposite direction, the reverse side of this flange is also made with an arrangement to accommodate that thrust. And this is the reverse side of this flange. You see, when the oil comes out from here, it travels through the grooves and it goes to the topmost groove and to the end and at the end the hole is drilled which goes right through and emerges on the other side of the flange you see on the other side of the flange at the top portion these holes are in continuity that means the oil comes out from here and again it spreads through these gutters or grooves to spread lubricating oil on these two surfaces on the reverse side of this flange and in the guide, you will see there is another two small surfaces which is capable of taking the support or taking the force from these two strips of metal when the guide, when the shoe is pulled in the opposite direction. And that is the direction when the compression stroke of the piston occurs. So when the engine is rotating for half a revolution, the force is in this direction with the major part of the surface taking the thrust. And then again, when this piston is making a compression stroke, the narrow side or the smaller area of the shoe takes the thrust on this guide. So the bolts which are holding the guide are one time under, not under compression. They, uh, that is the body of the frame that is taking. But when it is taking in the opposite direction, then the bolts are under a stressed condition. So the stress on these bolts is also prone to fatigue failures. So it is very important to check the tightness of these bolts frequently. If it is stretched, then this guide will go out of alignment. And what is the clearance between this surface and the guide surface is 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 millimeters for large engines. If you have a piece of paper and pen right beside you, you can write it down. The clearance in a guide and guide shoe is between 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 millimeters. So you can understand what is 0 0.5 millimeters, not centimeters, millimeters, half a millimeter 
to little more than half a millimeter. So that is the total clearance or total movement of the crochet, if at all there is any. Okay. Now, to allow rubbing of the surfaces, this surface is uh, got a layer of white metal. This white metal is actually layered on this steel surface, also layered on the side, and also layered on the narrow surface of the shoe. So the entire surface which is making contact with the guide is layered with white metal. Likewise, in the guide also, this inside surface is a layer of white metal. So it is totally white metal rubbing against white metal. So that is what provides the best or minimum friction and maximum conformability to the forces or the pressures between them. How is lube oil, Sankal Gupta has got a question. How is lube oil provided to the crosshead block? See, there are two means. It can come up right from the connecting rod, same as what you have. I'm still making that switch. I'm going to give it in the next class. I'm still in the process of making that diagram. So once I finish making that diagram, I don't know if you can see it. You will see it at some stage in the next diagram. Uh, it can come two ways. One is it comes through the connecting rod and into the bearing and then the oil goes through that and through this, then it comes to this and the whole place is lubricated. After the lube oil comes out from here, it simply drops into the crankcase because it, the whole crankcase is lubricated. A second mode where you have an arrangement for a pump which is fitted against the connecting rod and the angular movement of the connecting rod relative to the crosshead works that pump. And that pump is a positive displacement pump. So ultimately, it will be hydraulic pressure which will allow for the bearings to get that lubricating oil. So once the bearing get a very high pressure lubricating oil, that oil pressure will be forced through these passages to your guide shoe and guide. And that oil will be coming from an external source. It can come either through the connecting rod and then to the pump, or there can be a separate elbow pipe, which allows for high pressure lube oil connection to the bearing of this crescent. So there are two methods of lubrication, but that comes in a different lubricating oil chapters. I like your curiosity that you're keen to know. So I will definitely address your question. But when we learn more about the crosshead lubrication, we will come into that state. So, any questions on this crosshead? This is the kind of crosshead I would like you to practice drawing and ultimately explain because it has better explanation as compared to this one. This one is difficult to conceive also. And this one is equally a little ambiguous. So, best is, I think, this is the one and I have made it with uh, all the labels involved. I'm not sure how to put the labels here because this has been copied and scanned and then interpreted in time. So there are a lot of items missing over here. So best thing, this is the one that should help. Okay. So any questions on how this crosshead system works? Okay. Let's move on. Let's go on to... Ah, uh, yes. Yes, go ahead. In the part for the studs, uh, the studs on the top of the uh, box. Okay. These studs are ultimately used to hold the piston palm. The palm of the piston is what I'll show you here. Uh, here. You see this? This is the palm over here. This is the piston rod. This is the stuffing box. I will just now show you a video on the stuffing box. This is the palm and you see there are four holes over here at the four corners all right so those whole piston rod goes and rests on top of this over here so these studs pass through the piston rod palm and then the nuts are put to hold the piston rod tightly against the piston against the crossing the same diagram here you see here this is the palm of the piston and the studs are over here and these studs hold the piston rod in place, in position. Have you understood, Shubh? Yes, sir. Okay, let's move on. 
let's move on to piston assembly now piston assembly in a crosshead engine and a piston assembly in a two four stroke engine or trunk type engine is completely different in the two stroke engine the piston assembly consists of the crown the skirt the rings and the piston rod this is the entire piston assembly if the engine has inlet port and exhaust port then one two three four are valid that means the skirt is required if the engine does not have an exhaust port but has an exhaust valve that means this engine has an inlet port and an exhaust valve then you do not need a skirt the purpose of a skirt primarily is to keep the exhaust port and inlet port closed when the piston is at TDC. When the piston comes down to BDC, it will open the exhaust port first, then it will open the inlet port for the scavenging process to take place. This scavenging may be loop scavenging or it may be cross scavenging. But that happens only when the piston is below, a piston crown is below the inlet port or near TDC. Again, when it comes up, it covers the inlet and exhaust port and right till TDC, it remains covered. So how does it remain covered? It is the extended part of the piston, which is called a skirt that helps to keep it covered. Apart from keeping it covered, it also helps to keep the alignment of the piston satisfactory. It helps in keeping the piston in a very central position. All right. So remember, the components of a piston assembly is crown, skirt, rings, and piston rod. And of course, the nuts and studs and bolts, rubber ring seals, these are also there. So these are the non-principal part, but they're important parts, no doubt. Okay, so the material used in this piston assembly, the crown is generally made of cast steel, right? The skirt is made of cast iron because the cast skirt does not suffer as much stress as the cast steel. Cast steel is more costly, more difficult to machine and not necessary really. You don't need to make a ordinary pipe of, super, of titanium. It doesn't make sense. Of course, titanium is much stronger and all. It doesn't. So similarly, you don't need to make the cast iron I mean, skirt of cast steel. Cast iron is easy to make, cheaper to cost, and it performs the required function very well. Next is the piston rings. Rings are also made of cast iron. The piston rod is made of forged steel. I think in one of my earlier classes, I had asked, told you that the piston rings are made of much tougher material, solid material, or much tougher than the cylinder liner, which is also made of cast iron. But nobody has been able to tell me why the, uh, which is tougher, which is harder. Piston rings is harder. Why piston rings are harder? Nobody has been able to tell me. But ultimately, I have told the previous section, that is section F, because they also couldn't answer. And they kept finding out they couldn't uh, get a justified answer. So if you have a justified answer, you can tell me on the chat column. Let's move on. So that was your piston assembly in the two-stroke engine. Let's have a look. Uh, sir, uh, uh, yes. Me, sir. Yes. Go ahead. Sir, sir, you have asked the question that uh, why stainless steel is stainless. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know that. Do you remember? So, I it forgot. forms the cadmium ox uh, I, uh, So the answer is, sir, it forms the passive layer of cadmium oxide, sir. Uh, so uh, it it acts as a barrier between the metal and uh, the uh, reactants. So it 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 acts as a inert, like a Al2O3 in oxygen. It forms oxide layer. Similarly, cadmium cadmium oxide and uh, the present in the uh, stainless steel also forms the, the same layer, sir, with oxygen. Sir, won't be it chromium oxide rather than cadmium oxide? Yes, 
it is chromium oxide not cadmium oxide i was just going to point out shub that was a good pointer yes shubham yes, it is not cadmium cadmium is not used yes, chromium oxide yes sir yes sir yes okay chromium oxide yes sir okay but my question is why is what makes stainless steel stainless not all stainless steel is stainless if you see some of these curtain rods which you buy from the market and you put them up they are sold to you as stainless steel and they look like stainless steel but after 2 3 months you will find spots of rust forming on them it does not it is not stainless steel but it is sold to you as stainless steel but on ships you will see various nuts and bolts they are stainless steel even if there is no oxide formation on them there is no stain that forms on them and the why, why is that so some stainless steel have rust formation on them and most common part if you see if you have used <coughs> curtain rods <coughs> which are made of stainless steel those curtain rods are humbug and they form rust on the surface so my question to you was <coughs> what makes stainless steel stainless all right it is not just oxide formation there is more to it and it is not cadmium oxide it is chromium oxide of course you have corrected yourself that's fine so what makes stainless steel stainless not all stainless steels are stainless some uh, some stainless steels they start rusting also all right the watch the strap that you see in the old now of course everybody is using the uh, plastic type of straps but the uh, previous straps those are stainless steel those are proper stainless steel you leave them in water also they will not rust so what makes it stainless okay so let's move on with our subject others did not finish class those are off class questions but academic nevertheless in the four stroke engine the tongue type the assembly the piston assembly consists of the piston this piston may be one piece or it may be two pieces in the normal engines supercharged engines turbocharged engines they are still made of one piece aluminum alloy all right but there are newer and newer engines coming out which are high performance engines highly rated engine that means for a small engine they are getting enormous amount of power so these engines suffer from very high peak pressures stresses that is mechanical stresses and thermal stresses and because they are having very high exhaust gas temperatures so that is why aluminum alloy pistons cannot be used over there so they are using a two piece piston where the top part is made of cast steel and the lower part is made of either aluminum alloy or it is made of cast iron so you have the benefit of taking high stresses mechanical and thermal and at the same time providing lightness in weight for four stroke engines and high speed engine the four stroke engine that is medium speed engine and high speed engine the key element in the piston design is its weight you cannot afford to have a heavy piston if you have a heavy piston then the bearings will fail why because the piston mass is ultimately going to give you forces which have to be accommodated in the bearings you see the piston when it goes from tdc to bdc at mid stroke it has the highest velocity at the ends it is zero velocity that means it has to decelerate stop and again accelerate to maximum and again decelerate when it comes to tdc and stop and again accelerate from there to come to maximum velocity again decelerate and come so this maximum acceleration deceleration acceleration deceleration in every stroke will cause enormous forces on the bearing supports because ultimately the force is equal to mass into acceleration fundamental so if the mass is very heavy the force arising in those bearings is very heavy and that is why the bottom end bearing bolts of four stroke engines 
have to be changed after a stipulated time period of running, even if they are in very good condition. They have reached a potential of failure or reached a state where fatigue failure can take place any moment. All right. It is something like, you know, bending a wire. I bend it this side, I bend it that side. I bend it this side, I bend it this side. Need not be completely to some extent. So after some time, what will happen? It will break. So the bolts in the medium speed engine, bottom end bearing bolts, they are pulled, released, pulled, released, pulled, released. One million, ten million times. So they reach a stage where they have a chance of fatigue failure. So that is why the mass of the piston is a crucial factor in its design. And every attempt is made to make it as light as possible. That is why you find most of the pistons in medium speed, high speed, small engines are made of very light aluminum alloy. Very light alloy. So, so some of the pistons which are made in the racing car engines, they are light as a feather, feather light, but they are very strong. So that mass of the piston ultimately contributes to a lot of forces on the bearings. So that is why you have as light as possible piston. You don't have aluminum pistons in two-stroke engines, large two-stroke engines, nowhere. But you will have in your four-stroke engines. So the uh, sorry, what was our topic? We are talking about um, uh, piston assembly. The piston assembly consists of a piston, maybe one piece or two pieces. Then you have the piston rings. Then you have a bush, and this bush. Hold it, Sarthaki has got a question. So piston ring is harder since it is subject to tension, high temperature, viscosity of oil and friction, and at the same time it slides over the cylinder at a high speed, whereas the piston is subjected to only gas pressure and crankcase pressure. Sartaki, you have gone off the question completely. The question was, why is it that the piston ring is harder than the liner, not harder than the piston? The question is, the cast the liner is made of cast iron the piston ring is also made of cast iron which is harder everybody says piston ring is harder now the piston ring is harder the liner will wear off before the piston ring is that so be careful i am acting like an mmd examiner so i'm throwing you off the track so you have to be smart enough to come back on track Tartaki, oh, Shashwat has got an answer. Piston rings are harder because they undergo much rapid wear as they are continuously getting rubbed against the liner, whereas every section of the liner is suffering wear only when the absolutely. Shashwat, you got the nail on the head. Give him an applause. That is the right answer. You see, Sarthaki, now I will give it to you in a very simple okay. Yes, sir. Have you understood what he has said? So I, I have just messed up with uh, piston and cylinder liner. I forgot that what was the question, and that's why I put the piston and instead of cylinder liner. Otherwise, I had the same answer. Okay, okay, right. So you got the answer. Okay. The simple yes. way to explain it is consider a liner of one meter length and consider a piston ring of one centimeter height. Consider both of them as equal hardness. All right. So if the piston ring moves, one centimeter above, the liner has worn out by one unit at that section only, whereas the piston ring has moved, worn down by one unit on its one centimeter. As it goes on the next centimeter, piston ring again one unit. So by the time the piston ring moves up to the top of the liner, the piston ring will have worn out 100 units, and whereas the liner has worn out only one unit. So it requires the piston ring to be several times harder than the liner to maintain a certain life of the ring. All right. Okay, let's move on. So apart from the piston rings, a bronze bush. Now the next question is the bronze bush. This bronze bush <coughs> is not ever brass. What is bronze made of, Sartaki? And what is brass made of? Can you tell me? 
Uh, yes, sir. So I, uh, bronze is uh, a mixture of copper and tin, and brass is a mixture of copper and zinc. Very and bronze good. is a strong. Yes, sir. And bronze is stronger than brass, sir. Ah, very good. Very good. That's the right answer. Yes, so that is why you see on board the ship, brass is seldom used. Very seldom, unless it is for some <coughs> very not very important item that brass will be used. <coughs> <coughs> Just a second, my throat is going off. <clears throat> Bronze is more the item that is used on board the ship. Whether it is valve spindles, <clears throat> whether it is levers, whether it is handles, they are all bronze. Brass is almost never used. In fact, only place where it is used is the sounding bob of the sounding tape. You know what is the sounding tape? It is that steel tape at the end of which you have a brass weight. This is called a sounding bob. So when you take the depth of any liquid in a tank, you use that sounding tape. And that bob is strictly made of brass. Now you tell me why it is brass. Why can't it be made of mild steel or cast iron or cast steel or anything else? Why it is made of brass? So that answer you give me later. Let us move on with our subject. Others will never get ahead. So just remember the bronze bush is made of tin and copper and it is more durable, more resistant to wear and it provides a surface which is conducive to film formation of Luboy. The gudgeon pin is a forged steel body and it is held in place by circlips. Again that diagram should be, oh sorry not this one, where is the diagram? This is a four stroke piston assembly. This is a four stroke piston assembly. It consists of the piston consists of the gudgeon pin, it consists of the bronze bush and it consists of the circlips and the piston rings. The piston rings usually are the compression rings on top and the last ring is an oil control ring or oil scraper ring. Sometimes the scraper ring is located here right at the bottom. So that control ring resists any oil from going into the combustion chamber. So it is an oil control ring, sometimes it is called oil scraper ring. The important part of this piston, remember, that this is called the boss and strut region. What is a strut? A strut is basically a beam, a beam. So the gudgeon pin acts like a beam. You see the force on top of the piston is ultimately transmitted to the ends of the, of the gudgeon pin. And the gudgeon pin ends are forced downward. And as it is forced downward, because of the connecting rod and the bush, the center part of the gudgeon pin rests or pushes down on the bush, which is fitted inside the connecting rod. So this is called a beam and it is interpreted as a strut. <coughs> Bronze is much more resistant to corrosion. Anyway, I will come to that later. Let's finish this. So this place here is called the boss and strut region. The, what is the boss? The boss is this part of the piston, which is a thicker part, and it accommodates the gudgeon pin. This part is called the bus, is called the boss, and the strut is the gudgeon pin. Okay. Now, what is so re relevant about this boss and strut region? This full region must not under any circumstances exceed 200 degrees centigrade when the piston is running. Why is that? This is the boss and strut region and also the piston ring region must not exceed 200 degrees centigrade when it is running. That is why you see there is a junk, this distance from the top edge of the piston to the top ring is called a junk in English or it is called the part, a top land is sometimes mistaken as this part and also the crown. This part is the crown, this part is called the top land. This is called the top land. You see there is a top land here for the diesel engine, but this top land is not existent in a refrigeration and air conditioning air compressor. Air compressor is also is a four stroke engine, a four stroke Sorry, is like an engine. It is not four-stroke. 
an air compressor also has a piston similar to this but the piston rings will be located right on top over here why is that this is a question for all of you in an engine the piston rings are located a little down and the distance between the top end of the piston to the edge is called the junk j u n k or sometimes it is also called top land so this distance is given for only the engines in the case of an air compressor or a refrigeration compressor the piston ring top piston ring is right at this edge over here so you have to give me an answer why and why the temperature of this bus and start region must not exceed 200 degrees centigrade okay so that is your piston assembly what is the material used piston ring piston assembly the piston itself is mostly aluminum alloy in the case of two piece pistons you will have the top part made of cast steel and the lower part can be made of anything else anything else that is suitable the rings are again cast iron the bush is bronze gudgeon pin is forged steel and circuits are spring steel okay so this is what the piston assembly is about let's have a look at the diagram of a two stroke piston in a manufacturing engine manufacturing place or it might be only yeah eh, piston manufacture this is not on board the ship you can never have six pistons of a large engine laid out like this in the engine room or on board the ship so this has to be a place in a workshop or a factory where the engine is manufactured or only where the pistons are manufactured you see this is a large bore two stroke piston and there is no skirt on it it is just got the crown and it is got a top land this distance from the top edge of the piston to the top ring is called the top land and this is only possible or only allowed in engines it is not allowed in air compressors or in your refrigeration and air conditioning compressors so why is that you will have to find out the answer okay the lower part is the piston rod and then this whole piston is held up by a crane and this is the piston rod and this here is the stuffing box it has been dismantled from the diaphragm this lower end of the part is actually a stool this stool is used to support it support the other this thing will fall on top of the palm over here it is a sliding surface inside the uh, stuffing box just after this i will give you a video on the stuffing box what this is about because i do not have any drawings made out the best thing would be to actually give you a video where they have a detailed explanation of its construction of its dismantling and its assembly you will be able to understand okay now let's have a look at the next diagram okay now this piston assembly the first one is a water cooled piston pistons remember large pistons in particular can be cooled either by water or by the oil which oil the same crankcase oil can be used all right now cooling water water which is uh, piston which is cooled by water will be something like this and this piston also has a facility where you have bores bores are small uh, drilled passages and these passages are basically intended to cool the components which are heated the most and components which are heated the most are the parts of the combustion chamber the combustion chamber suffers at temperatures of 300 350 400 degrees centigrade but the bearing down below suffers 75 65 55 55 so those parts do not need bore cooling only the components which are very high temperature like the combustion chamber walls they need bore cooling so the piston crown it forms part of the combustion chamber wall and that is why it needs bore cooling so the bores that you see in this piston crown are holes which are drilled in this mold and this entire piston assembly consists of the crown with a little open space here and then you have the skirt you see this part is the skirt it is also a cylindrical cast iron body with a interior flange 
this interior flange is then sandwiched between the tabletop of the piston rod and the crown. So it is like a sandwich and long studs hold the piston rod and the skirt and the crown all three together. So this assembly is the assembly for a water cooled piston. Now, besides this, you have two tubes. These are actually stainless steel tubes and they are fitted inside. They are shrunk fit or fitted by some means inside the crown and helps in providing for the lubricant uh, for the cooling water to go in and provide lubrication and then uh, provide cooling and then come out from there. You can actually see only one pipe here because the other pipe is behind this pipe. So one path shows the cooling water going up into the crown and the other arrowhead shows the water coming out from the crown. There is one error in this diagram and that error is this arrowhead. This arrowhead should be in the opposite direction. <clears throat> you see, the water must go inside upward this way. This is okay. This arrowhead is showing upward. And from here, it should enter into this space. Because after it enters this space, the whole place has to fill up. And once it fills up, it comes up to a level where it can simply pour out from the top. If it goes and fills up from the top, it will simply pour out so easily. It will not fill up the space. Importance in any cooling body is it has to be fully filled up with the cooling medium, that is the water. And then that excess water can be drained out to extract the heat that has been transferred to the water. So this arrowhead is a mistake and the arrowhead should be down here showing the uh, movement of the water into this space over here. And after this space fills up, this is supposed to go up and then come out from there. Apart from that, when the engine is running, you see this water inside, it starts moving up and down. Because the piston is reciprocating, so that whole mass of water is also going to reciprocate. So in the process, the water is going to splash and go inside these bores. And the hottest part is the part closest to the exposed surface of the combustion chamber, that is top of the piston crown. And that heat is immediately transferred to inner sides of the bore. So if the water reaches there, it extracts the heat from there and is able to discharge most of the heat. So the temperature differential between this point and this point is defined definitely much less. So the thermal stress between the two surfaces occurring is also eliminated. At the same time, the thickness of this uh, crown is retained. It will not weaken the crown where mechanical stresses are involved. All right. So this is what a bore cooled arrangement is provided. In another design, you can have the cooling water passing through the piston rod. And when it comes here, there is a box like structure. And from the box, you have individual nozzles coming out. And those nozzles, each of them, will inject water directly into the groove. So the water has a better chance to reach that groove. And even when the piston has momentarily been stopped while running, the water will not be splashing, but it will be injected by the nozzles right into the uh, bores and provide for cooling even when the engine is stopped. The drawback of this particular design is that immediately after firing, when the engine is momentarily stopped, suppose you are maneuvering, then the water will become stagnant over here or it will just flow like this and flow out without any splashing. But the heat from there is not being extracted fully. Again, when the engine starts moving, then the water will start going into this place. Whereas in the better design, you will have nozzles fitted on this piston rod, which will individually inject water to each of these grooves and the water will be passing through the uh, center part, going to the nozzle, and then falling out from the outer ring or outer diameter of that path which is going in. I will show you a diagram which will explain this. Let's read this matter which is written here. Water cooled piston with bore cooling. The cooling water is pumped up through the cooling water standpipe, also called telescopic pipe. These are called standpipes or telescopic pipes. 
and these pipes are moving up and down along with the piston. The space allows for some accumulation of the water. This space that you see here allows for some water to be accumulated. So when the reciprocating and reciprocating movement of the piston enables the water inside the bores to cool the hottest region of the crown. So when the splashing takes place, the water enters these spaces and removes the heat. And this method is sometimes called as the cocktail shaker method. If you go to the roadside lassi maker, he puts the lassi, the ghee, the what he calls the yogurt, the water, the ice, and little masala in it, and he puts a cover on top, a glass, and then he shakes it up. All right. After shaking it up, the stuff is mixed and is given to you as mix. But his intention was not to cool the upper glass, but in the process of the ice moving up and down with the cold water, cools the upper part also. So the same effect is produced here. So when the water moves up and down, the upper part is also cooled. That is why this method is called a cocktail shaker effect. I hope that is reasonably easy to understand. A return telescopic pipe sends the heated water back to the cooling and recirculation pipeline. So the return pipe will again send that water back into the system for recirculating, cooling, etc. And then it comes back again. The pipe in the line with the inlet pipe, so it is not visible. So one pipe is behind the other pipe. So that is why you can see only one pipe. Alternatively, nozzles may be fitted to direct the water to the cooling board. See, over here, there can be nozzles fitted, which will directly cool the nozzle, the pores by means of water being injected into the system. Let's have a look at the diagram. Now, here you have the piston crown. And these are the bores that you see. See how many of them are there. These bores are intended to allow the water to reach the topmost part of the crown. And at the same time, the thickness of the crown is retained to help provide mechanical strength under gas pressure loads. So the mechanical strength is retained and the thermal stress is reduced. So there is no thermal stress because the heat is removed. How is it removed? You see, this is the piston rod. On the piston rod, you have multiple number of nozzles. The water which is coming through the piston rod ultimately is injected out from the piston rod and each nozzle is directed into each hole that you see here. So the water is directly injected into the bores to extract the maximum heat. So when the piston engine is stopped even momentarily, the piston is still hot. So to cool it, these nozzles continuously inject water into the system. It is not that suddenly when the piston is engine is stopped, the heating has stopped. The heating is there. The heat is gradually being transferred to the entire piston. So again, when the engine is started, the nozzles, uh, the splashing of the water will help. So better than that is to have these nozzles. The only drawback is if these nozzles get choked, then you have a problem. And give me one minute, I have to get my bottle of water. I need to drink some water. My throat is getting dry. Let me put my... Oh. Which is left and which is right. Okay. I think I have to tag these here for us. So this is a much more effective means of cooling the piston crown. Any questions? Oh, there are some questions. One minute. Sir, what is the difference between jacket cooling and bore cooling? Oh my God. So this is a very late stage to ask such a question. Jacket cooling is cooling of the liner body because the jacket, what you see, is the entablature. Between the entablature and the liner, there is a wall of water. Okay. This wall of water is continuously coming in from one end and the ribs on the top of the surface of the liner 
helps the water to be circulated all around the liner. This is jacket cooling. All right. Bore cooling is cooling through narrow passages. Now, on top of the cylinder liner, you will have holes which are drilled at a slant. These bores are used for bore cooling of the combustion belt, which is the hottest part of the cylinder liner. After it cools this combustion belt, the water comes out and there is a device which allows the water to be collected and transferred to the cylinder cover. Now the cylinder cover also will have a narrow passages which are very close to the combustion chamber walls. So there again you have bore cooling. All right. So you have bore cooling in the cylinder liner, you have bore cooling in the cylinder cover, then you have bore cooling in the piston crown. That's now this is what is called bore cooling in the piston crown. No, not this, uh, this one. Not this, this one. Yeah. These holes which are drilled are ultimately bore cooling. So what you see here, this is a photograph in a factory where they are manufacturing these pistons. So these are the bores and these are the nozzles which help in sending water to the bores. So that is the difference between bore cooling. Okay. Okay. Now, Shashwat Kumar has asked, Sir, is it possible for engines with very long strokes to have piston skirts? It's not required. See, those ones, it is not just the stroke that matters. It is whether it has an exhaust valve. If it has an exhaust valve, then it doesn't need a skirt. It is not the stroke that determines or only stroke, short stroke engines have a piston skirt. Well, yes, short stroke generally have because that time they did not have the exhaust valve. But if it has an exhaust valve, then it does not need a skirt. Because the purpose of the skirt is to keep the inlet and exhaust ports closed when the piston is at the TDC. If the skirts are not closed, then the exhaust gas will either go into the inlet port or the inlet port will go, inlet air will go into the exhaust port. So there will be a short circuit. So to keep the two holes or the two passages covered, you need the skirt. Shashwat, is that clear? Good, that's right. Let's move on. So, what, so we just now discussed a piston which had which had uh, water cooled. So this diagram should be reasonably easy for you to draw also. And this is the diagram I generally give in class for the boys to draw. So next, let's look at the uh okay we have read this let's look at the oh my god we're running short of time it's already 10 58 almost 11. i have to 11 20 you have no okay we have enough time let's finish this this is an oil cool piston you see the oil cooling allows for the oil to come through the center bore of the piston and then cool the upper part of the piston that is the underside of the upper part of the piston because that is the hottest region and then after it cools it goes over a dam it is not that the oil can fall over here it has to pass this place and over this path and come into the lower part so that means this surface it has to be covered with the oil and then when it comes down the sides are also covered with the oil so the oil extracts the heat from the entire inner surface of the piston before it goes out and it goes out from the outer diameter hole of the piston so this is an oil cooled piston and the biggest advantage is if there is any oil leakage it doesn't matter because the same oil is used in the crankcase so the crankcase oil is only circulated through and through okay so the oil cooled piston advantages are it is used extensively in the modern engines okay Oil leakage into the crankcase does not cause contamination problems as it is the same oil as the crankcase oil. The lower thermal conductivity gives less steep temperature gradient over the piston crown. What does it mean? You see, oil has a <coughs> is a poor conductor of heat and also it has a low specific heat as compared to water. What is specific heat? 
it is the quantum of heat, amount of heat required to raise one gram of the material through one degree centigrade. All right. For water, it is one calorie, I think, or joule, one joule or one calorie, one calorie. One calorie, one calorie is required to raise one gram of water through one degree centigrade. That is your specific heat. For the lube oil, it is much less. So when you throw water, the heat extraction is much more for the same mass of water that is thrown. But when you throw the same mass of oil, the same amount of heat extraction is not there. So it does not suffer from very severe temperature gradients. That means it doesn't overcool the substance to certain extent. All right. So that is what it means. That is the advantage. You see, you have to look very in detail what is the advantage. But it is considered an advantage for water. Water can remove more heat for the reduced mass. But for oil, you need a bigger mass of oil to extract the same amount of heat. But the advantage of oil is it does not cool the surface excessively to cause a thermal stress of that body. Okay. And its supply arrangement is simple. Well, nothing is really simple, but it is just an added point. Because it does not require any special sealing so that if it leaks, it will cause damage to the oil. Because if it leaks, it leaks into the same oil. What are the disadvantages? The temperatures need to be kept low to avoid oxidation of the oil. Hey, how does this happen? Okay. The temperature need to be kept low to avoid oxidation of the oil. Now, suppose you have an overheated piston and this oil goes and contacts that overheated surface. What is going to happen? That oil is going to start burning or partial burning or even if it is excessive, it will start carbonizing. And this carbonizing effect will be a deposit of carbon on the internal walls. And this deposit will act as an insulator. And if it is an insulator, then there will be no more heat attraction. So the oil which comes out will have hardly any difference with the temperature of the oil that is going in. And you will think, oh, it is fine. But actually that piston is getting overheated and you are not aware. So do not believe in the cooling water outlet temperature to be a very accurate indicator. It could be if the insulation inside is very heavy, then the inlet and outlet temperature of that oil will be more or less the same. Okay, this is one. And uh, overheating occurs, the oil will carbonize on the underside of the piston and form an insulating layer. This aggravates the overheating issue and results in severe consequences. Severe consequences mean very, very severe consequences. You can have a piston seizure. A piston seizure is an overheated piston which will weld itself with the piston rings and the liner and remain stuck. So if that happens, you will have to remove the piston liner, piston all together out, which is an enormous task. So that is your oil piston pool. This, of course, everybody has seen. I have shown this umpteen number of times. So it should be reasonably clear. And you should be able to draw if you are asked to explain the piston assembly of a four-stroke engine. Next, let's go on to the piston rings. Piston rings, we will not go about with such detail here, but I have a diagram which should help you out. And this is the arrangement of a trunk type of piston assembly. It has got the connecting rod. It has got the piston. It has got the piston pin, which is the gudgeon pin. And it has got piston rings, which are called compression rings. And it has also got an oil control ring, which is sometimes called just oil ring. Usually they are called oil scraper rings or oil control rings or sometimes just oil rings. All right. And of course, the connecting rod, you see, my question to you now is, of course, it will be, the answer will be given to you in your next class. In the meantime, you can do some thinking. Why is the connecting rod of a medium speed engine or a high speed engine or a four stroke engine in the form of an eye section. So this is not a solid rod. It is an eye section beam or eye section rod. In the case of a two stroke engine, you have a round section rod. All right. 
So that is a question I would like you to answer. And these are the various types of piston rings which are there. Some are coated with ceramic, some are coated with chromium. So these help in reducing the wear down of the piston ring. Piston rings are made from cast iron alloyed with chromium, molybdenum, vanadium, titanium, nickel, and copper. These are in very small proportions. But the key element is cast iron. They are harder than cylinder liner in which they run to give them maximum life before they are renewed. What is the function of the piston rings? So you need to give an engineer's answer. And the engineer's answer is here. One, two, and three. Piston rings have the following jobs to perform. They seal the gas space by expanding outward due to gas pressure acting from behind. It is not only the gas pressure. The spring tension of the piston ring helps to keep the piston pressed against the liner. Over and above this, the gas pressure, which is on top of the piston, goes to the top piston ring. Then it goes through the gap between the ring and the groove and goes behind the piston ring to force the piston ring against the liner walls. So it is not only spring pressure that is acting on the spring against the liner. It is the gas pressure which forces the piston ring against the liner walls. Okay. And this is maximum for the top piston ring. That is why the liner wear at the uppermost part of the combustion belt has the maximum wear. Next function of the piston ring is to spread the lubricating oil up and down of the liner wall surface. And third function is, <coughs> yeah, the third function is transfer the heat from the piston to the cylinder liner. From there, the heat will be carried to the jacket cooling water. You see, the piston does not touch the liner. It is the piston ring that touches the liner. So the heat from the piston, apart from being removed by the cooling water, also has some amount of heat distributed to the liner from through the piston rings. But that is a smaller amount. Major part of the heat is removed through the cooling water. Okay. So when overhauling the piston, it is important to check the piston ring grooves for wear and piston ring condition. The piston ring butt clearance and axial clearances between the ring and the groove is measured and recorded. Butt clearance is the clearance between the ends of the piston. So there has to be some clearance. If there is no clearance, that means the piston ring is tight inside the liner, which will cause very severe damage. There has to be a clearance to allow the springiness of the piston to work. All right, that is the butt clearance. The axial clearance is after the ring is fitted inside the groove, what is the clearance between the piston ring and the wall of the groove? That clearance also is very important. Otherwise, the piston ring will get caught inside the groove and it will not function as a free ring. Okay, so that will be all for today, but I will want to show you a, a, a minute, just a minute. I want to show you the stuffing box. Where is it? Yeah, okay, here it is. This is the stuffing box and how it is dismantled, overhaul of the piston rod. I hope everybody can see this. Shubh, can you see this? Shashwat, can yes, you see this? Yes, sir, we can see it, sir. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, now, this is the stuffing box, what you see. This is the piston rod. And like in an oil cool, the, this is the path. Over here, it has shown reverse. In the diagram we picked up, the oil was going up from the center and coming out from the side. So each design has its own method. But the internal pa internal passages are for the cooling medium, for the medium to reach the piston crown. Here going to, we are going to deal with only the stuffing box. This is the stuffing box. And this flange, what you see at the bottom, is bolted to the diaphragm, which separates the crankcase space and the under piston space. So let's move on. Safety shoes, hearing protection is not required because the engine is stopped. 
Of course, you have to wear a boiler suit and other similar protective gear. Okay, so that is it. Uh, let's move on a little faster. Dismantling of the stuffing box. Let's go. See, first he has put the piston on a stool. Now he is lifting up with a chain block against the piston itself. This is the piston rod. Now he will fit one table top here, which is in two halves. Once he fits the table top, he can rest the uh, stuffing box and remove the chain. After he removes the chain, he can dismantle the stuffing box. This is a table top which is fitted in two halves and bolted from bottom to allow that stuffing box to rest on this surface. Once it rests on this surface, you can dismantle it very comfortably. On the ship, we don't use this. We use the floor plate. So every time a part is removed, we put it down on the floor plate. And on the plate, floor plate, we put gunny bags. Gunny bags is soft, so the surfaces of these parts will not get damaged. But this fellow, and remember, this video is only for demonstration. That is why you are seeing such a clean, clean, very clean stuffing box. When you take it out from the engine room, you will see a mass of black sludge. You will not be able to see the stuffing box. So you will have to first clean the sludge from the surface and then be able to see this stuffing box. Here it is a demo. That is why everything is so clean. Now he is removing the fitted bolts. These bolts are not ordinary fitted bolts. First he opens out the washers. After he removes the washers, then he can open the fitted bolt. This is a O-ring which provides the sealing inside the housing of the stuffing box. See, when the stuffing box is lowered, the flange rests on the uh, diaphragm. But this ceiling is against the casing. There is a casing above the diaphragm which houses, and this provides the seal. So on top of this point, you will have a lot of sludge. Now, these bolts are fitted bolts. He has to hammer this bolt to push it out. And this ensures correct alignment of the two halves of the uh, stuffing box casing. See, these are fitted bolts. They are not loose bolts. They have to be hammered out. And now this part will come out. Now, he has shown you only one side. The other side is also the same. He has to push it out. And the other side bolt he has already removed before. He didn't show you. Now, he's using a feeler gauge. Now, these are sealing rings and these are scraper rings. Sealing rings provide sealing against the air and oil from going in. And scraper rings scrape off any oil that might have escaped the sealing rings. Scraper rings will scrape off the cylinder oil. And some scraper rings will scrape off the crankcase oil. Both. Now, these are the sealing rings and they are made of bronze and they are held in place by garter springs. These are springs which are hooked at the ends and they form like rubber bands. And there are four of these sealing rings to make a complete circle. <clears throat> See, and each ring, each segment must match. One is to one, two is to two, three is to three, four is to four. Each of them must match with each other because the internal surface has been already worn out and they are matching the piston rod. So you cannot change this ring over here and this one over there. They have to be matching exactly as it has been dismantled. So this gap over here is very crucial. So he's measuring the gap between the rings and the gap will reduce with time of use because the internal surface gets worn out and as the internal surface of the ring gets worn out, the gaps will become smaller and smaller and smaller. So if they have reached a certain small gap, then what they have to do is change these segments. These bronze segments will have to be changed. And the gap, when it is new, has to be large. And when it is worn out, the gaps will become very small because the internal surface of the ring will have worn out because it is rubbing against the piston rod. So this is your stuffing box ceiling ring. Remember, this is a demo and all the parts were cleaned before assembly and now they are being again dismantled for a video taking program.
see how he removes the garter springs. They are like hooks hooked to each other. But these are the tools which are used for unhooking the springs. And if you use anything else, you are likely to injure your fingers. You have to be good with your hands. Some strength is also required. So during your off time, you better be doing some exercises to improve your physical strength. So these are the scraper rings. You see, once the oil is scraped, where will it go? Between the two upper end and lower end of that ring, there are gaps. So those gaps are leading out into a passage which the oil goes out of the engine room. Remember, cylinder oil is used only once. The used oil which drains into the under piston spaces is drained out of the engine. Now here, he's checking the elasticity of the spring. <laughs> he's checking the elasticity of the spring and ensuring that it has not reached a permanent set so that the pressure on the rings is still the same as what it was in the original. I don't have any notes to give you on stuffing box, so I'm showing you a video. And <clears throat> this is also a learning experience. So have a look at him. He's checking how much extension is required with a certain force, how much it extends, whether there has been any permanent set in the spring. Because if the spring pressure is inadequate, then the sealing and scraping of those rings will also be inadequate. So ultimately, it is the spring which gives the pressure on the scraping rings and the sealing rings. Now he will do the assembly. He will first put a layer of lubricant. Oh no, first he is checking for any uneven surface of the piston rod. If there is any, he will use the oil stone. Oil stone is the same thing as you see in a barber shop where he sharpens his razor. That stone is called an oil stone. And this one is a smooth oil stone because the surface has to be super smooth. And actually it is super smooth. He has just rubbed it to show you that he is rubbing it up. Now let's have a look at the assembly. Now here is the dowel pin which keeps the cover plate and the ring in alignment. This one is the scraping edge of the ring. This is the spring cross section. Now he's putting a layer of lubricant, which is the molly coat. And this molly coat helps. Molybdenum disulfide is the full name. Molly coat is the short name. These are your scraper rings. And now, right now you see the springs are in position. This is actually a sketch. So this is the spring and this is the ring. <clears throat> when it scrapes, you see these holes over here. These are the holes through which the oil comes out if the oil has been scraped off from the surface. And once it comes out from this oil hole, it is allowed to drain into a passage just outside the ring, but inside the housing. And from there, it is drained out of the engine. Cylinder oil is used only once. After it is used, it is sludge. It is contaminated oil. It is not used anymore. So, Excuse me, sir. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. But now it's our time to move to our next class, sir. Okay. Now, if, okay, okay. We will see it another time. All right. So let me put it off and say bye bye to you. And who is the class in charge? In section E, Subankar Singh. Yes, sir. You'll have, yes, sir. You'll, yes, give me the attendance. Sir. Okay, okay. All, so, all, oh. all, are, all were present today, sir. All. Oh uh, yeah, the I saw thirty-nine Okay, hundred percent attendance. Very good. Keep it up. Let Thank me you. stop recording. Okay, bye-bye. Take care.